Good evening, everyone. I hope that you are all keeping well, and I hope you are enjoying some of the relaxing of some of the lockdown restrictions that we've had. I know I've been able to get out and play a little bit of golf, which I've enjoyed, even though I've been all over the show. Um, but it has been enjoyable to be out, and I, and I trust you're getting some freedom. And I hope that all of you are also keeping well. It's wonderful that you've tuned in. For those of you who perhaps do not regularly attend the church but have tuned in from different places, maybe even different countries, we hope that you will have a really positive experience. We're glad that you've tuned in. We're glad that you're with us, and we trust that as we worship together, we would be uh, informed by God, that we would be touched by the Spirit, and that we would grow in our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Folk, uh, I do want to remind you that we are having a Mission's Emphasis Week this Sunday and next Sunday. It's going to be a little bit different, obviously, because we can't meet together. But we do have two mission speakers that we've invited, in fact, more than two. We've invited Matt, who is at Sydney Missionary and Bible College to preach for our evening service. So it's a great privilege and joy to have him with us this evening as he is going to bring God's word. We're going to chat a little bit and we're going to get to know him a little bit better. Uh, So stay with us as we uh, ask him a couple of questions. But can I remind you that this is an opportunity for us as a church uh, to really focus in on missions. We support a number of missionaries and we want to continue to keep a strong focus and emphasis of this church on missions. It's really important that we don't become so inward looking that we only focus on what we're doing rather than reaching out to beyond our borders and even for some of those who are working within our country. So can I encourage you to be generous over this time? Uh, We will have a certain mission that we will be supporting. Liz will say something about that a little later to you. And I want to encourage you to give generously because we serve such a wonderfully generous God. Hi, Liz. Hello, Scott. It's really good to be here. Uh, Thank you for joining us. This is probably the easiest way that I could think of to um, have you as part of the the evening service as our video series has kind of become uh, more focused specifically on the sermon. But uh, as you mentioned to us this morning, this week is Mission Emphasis Week. And we're now living in what is our current new reality and doing Mission Emphasis Week at the moment is a bit different. And to be fair, Mission at the moment also looks different. So can you tell us a little bit about what Mission Emphasis Week is going to look like for us this week and how we're uh, supporting our mission family? Mm. Well, as you know, we're still having uh, speakers for two Sundays in May. That's our normal practice for Mission Emphasis Week. Uh, And and that's great uh, because the most important thing about Mission Emphasis Week is hearing from God's word Mm. about mission and how uh, important it is for all of us to be involved in it. Uh, So uh, this morning we heard from uh, Ted Boyce mm-hmm. and uh, we're hearing from Matt tonight and then next week we have one of our own uh, church mission family, uh, Millard Slayman, back mm-hmm. in Australia to talk to us. Um, Millard certainly wasn't anticipating his home assignment would go quite the way it has. I bet. But um, yeah, it, it's great that we, we're going to be able to hear from him. Uh, mm-hmm. Just a reminder for everyone, we actually have 10 uh, different missionary units and uh, they're working in Australia and five other countries around the world. Uh, This year, instead of the normal uh, booklet with lots of information about our mission, we've got one sheet this time, which hopefully you received from the church office on Friday, but that just gives you all of our missionaries, uh, the names uh, of the adults, not of the children. I couldn't fit them in, sorry, but little photos and their information some of them have new email addresses I'm sure many of them will be very happy to hear from you mm. so I would like to encourage you to take the opportunity to uh, drop them a note uh, some of them may be zoomed out but they might be very happy to have a zoom call with you uh, as well but the most important thing uh, for us is to let them know that we are thinking of them we're supporting them financially but we're also uh, thinking of them and praying for them and it, it, it really encourages them when we let them know that Mm. Uh, This year um, for Mission Emphasis Week, uh, because of the coronavirus and uh, 
the fact that uh, for, for many people, things are a bit more difficult. We're just having one project uh, this year for our Mission Emphasis Week, and it's to support some members of our church family, uh, Josh and Amanda Pigeon in Romania. And Josh and Amanda went back to Romania in August last year, and they were with international teams when they went back. But international teams in Australia has actually closed down. Mm. So Josh and Amanda have just been accepted as missionaries with Pioneers, which uh, is really exciting for them. And mm -hmm. Pioneers are really happy to have them and are very supportive of their work with the Roma Workers Network. And our project this, this year is to support uh, the next conference that Amanda and Josh are hosting for the Roma Workers now, it should already have taken place in a pre-COVID world. The, the uh, conference would have happened in the first week in May, uh, but now uh, they're hoping that they'll be able to have it in September for up to 100 workers. That's mm -hmm. uh, Roma people, Romanians and uh, foreign uh, workers who are working to uh, reach out to the Roma people in various places. The Roma people are uh, marginalised and despised. And in Romania, some are even blaming the Roma people for the coronavirus. Wow. Uh, yeah, wow. Um, yeah. So working, uh, working amongst the Roma is often very tough. Mm. Uh, it's exhausting and can be very lonely. And the Roma Workers Network that Amanda and Josh have set up uh, has really helped to bring these Roma workers together so that they can encourage each other and also collaborate and work together to reach the Roma people. So this is the third conference and um, it's exciting that um, they're going to be able to get together again and then also include some new people. Mm -hmm. And the idea of sponsoring is that many of the people that Amanda would like to have come can't actually afford to go. Mm -hmm. um, so... So what's our target this year and how yeah, so, oh, that that's help? a really good question, Scott. Mm. Our target this year is five thousand dollars and that will cover sponsorships for twenty five to thirty people. Which is really massive because that's nearly a third of the conference. Yeah. That that's Amazing. right. Yeah. Yeah. So um Manda doesn't want the lack of finance the reason why people aren't able to attend. Sure. Um, so thank you, Liz, um, for giving us so much background on what we're supporting and how, um, uh, how far this money can really go in impacting the work that Josh and Manda are doing and, of course, the Roma workers that are going to be supported through this. If you want to give, and I ask that you do prayerfully consider how you can give to this, um, we're asked to give sacrificially and certainly there are times at the moment that we are being asked to sacrifice. Um, you can give, uh, you should have been sent an email that gives you instructions on how to give, but basically it's done via direct deposit to the church account, which can be uh, referenced as MEW so that we know exactly where that money is going to go. Uh, again, thank you so much for your time, Liz, and um, I hope that you continue doing what you're doing really well and we'll speak to you next week for round two of our Mission Emphasis Week. Thanks, Scott. It's been great to be here. Thanks, Liz. Hi, Matt. Uh, thank you for coming to our church. We appreciate you coming and we appreciate the, your time taken out. I know uh, you're a busy person. Uh, the church don't know you. I don't know you. This is the first time I've met you. So it'd be great for you just to tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, who you're married to, a bit of your background, where you grew up and maybe your family. Yeah. Yeah. So my name's Matt, as, as Ian said. I'm Sydney born and bred. Uh, married to a lady named Kiri, and we have three children. We have two daughters and a son. Uh, two daughters are in high school, and our son's uh, in primary school at the moment. Uh, so we live at, live in Strathfield, and I work at Sydney Missionary and Bible College. Matt, can you tell us a little bit about what you do at Sydney Missionary and Bible College? Uh, I know you're a lecturer there. What are you lecturing? How long have you been there? Uh, what's your experience been so far? Yes, yeah, so I started at SMBC at the beginning of last year, 2019, and I'm one of the New Testament lecturers there. So uh, mainly do Acts, so I'm doing uh, 
a course on John at the moment, John's Gospel. I've done some stuff on um, other introductory issues in the Gospels as well. Now, Matt, we've had a number of people in this church go through Sydney Missionary and Bible College. In fact, we've, I think we've got, you've got students there that used to come to the church that are currently there. If I were saying to someone in the church, there are a couple of Bible colleges in Sydney, there's Morling, there's Moore College, there's SNBC, why would you say SNBC is a good option for them to come to? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think it would depend, of course, on what you're looking for, but I think there are a number of distinctives about SMBC uh, that really make the study and learning experience quite unique. So one of them, as the name suggests, is the missional focus, so Sydney Missionary and Bible College. So we have a very strong focus on the Bible, of course, but also on missions. So teaching about missions, preparing people for missions, but not exclusively that. I think another distinctive of, of SMBC is that uh, we really work hard on a communal and community atmosphere. Now, obviously, in the current situation, that's uh, largely affected, but it is a distinctive of SMBC. We have quite a number of students, both uh, or singles, marrieds and families, live on. Uh, a lot of people have meals together. The faculty and staff have meals with all the students as well. So there's a very big community feel. Um, yeah, and I think also there is a strong interdenominational focus which uh, allows people from different denominations and sometimes different points of view to be able to interact with each other, uh, which can often be healthy, especially in a classroom setting and other such settings like that. Matt, having been there a couple of years now, what do you find some of the challenges with students, some of the things you, you find difficult, other things that you enjoy? Just give us a bit of an insight into some of those things, if you would. Yeah, well, there's definitely a lot more things that I enjoy than uh, challenging. I think I'm, I'm someone that's relatively extroverted, so I like interacting with people. And so uh, that environment is very conducive to that. You have people that come that want to study and learn the Bible, and that's great. Uh, that's what we're on about. And when people are enthusiastic about that and passionate about that and their relationship with God, that just makes things so much easier and more enjoyable. Uh, I think you know, some of the challenges are that there are a relatively large number of students, and so some can... You know, some can get lost in the woodwork, so to speak. And what I mean by that is, you know, you, you know with the faculty-to-student ratio, where I, I used to work in Portugal, well, you had, you know, like one faculty to every three or four students. Here, you're probably looking at every 40 or 50. And so, you know, you can't always build as close a relationship or as deep a relationship with all the students. That's just impossible. Yeah. Matt... Um what kind of things can we as a church, when we think about praying, we like to pray for, obviously, people involved in, in, in full-time work in whatever capacity. So what are some of the things we could be praying for you for as a church? Yeah, thanks, Ian. Um, I think if you could pray that, yeah, that God would, or that I would be open to the way God wants to use me at SMBC. Now, that might sound a bit funny, but there are opportunities for lots of different things outside of teaching and you know, different people to invest in that, that I would do that well and in a way that honours God. Uh, yeah, pray for, on a personal level, my wife and I, as we continue to bring up our kids, that we would bring them up in the ways of the Lord and you know, that they would grow up to love and serve him. I mean, that's our desire above everything else. Um, also pray for SMBC a bit more generally. There's a, a new principle starting in July, so we would appreciate your prayers for that as well. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Really appreciate, again, you coming, and uh, we really are looking forward to hearing from God's Word as you bring it to us uh, this morning. Yeah, so, thanks. This you. evening, rather. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Well, good evening. Um, it's good to be here, have the opportunity to be able to share with you, even if it's online, um, the privilege of sharing God's word with you. Um, yes, I want to thank Ian for the invitation and um, yeah, for the privilege of being able to do this. Uh, when I was at school and university in particular, there was one type of assessment that I really didn't like. It was the group presentation. Now, sometimes it would be because you would be put with people that you barely knew. 
Other times, even if you knew them, then there were these struggles organising it. You know, some people would do lots of work, others would do little. And then the presentation itself was often awkward with weird transitions. Group presentations, I just didn't like them. But there was one presentation I did at uni that I was very glad that I did. In this particular case, there was a student in the group who was really into trying new ways of doing things. Her name was Katrina. Now, I went to uni back in the early to mid-90s at the dawn of the technological age in many ways. A lot of our assignments were still handwritten. Uh, presentations, the, the visual part was either done on you know, drawings on bits of cardboard or if you're really technologically advanced, you would use the overhead projector. And if you don't know that, what that is, you can ask your parents. At the time, Microsoft Office was new. A lot of people used Word, but, but programs like PowerPoint were really unknown and rarely used. Well, Katrina wanted to use PowerPoint for this presentation. She wanted to give us a bit of an edge. And, and while we liked the idea, we were all a bit hesitant because none of us knew how to use it. But Katrina wasn't phased by the pushback, telling us that just a couple of weeks ago, herself, she didn't even know how to use PowerPoint. And then she pulled out this book with a bright yellow cover. Office for Dummies was the title. This book, she said, tells you all that you need to know about PowerPoint and how to use it in plain, simple language. And she was right. Plain language, easy to understand, easy to follow. And within a couple of hours, all of us knew how to use PowerPoint, at least at a basic level. That was a great experience for, for me, not just because I learned how to use PowerPoint, because I was introduced to the Four Dummies books as well. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. There are over 2,500 titles now, all sorts of things. Asian cooking for dummies, Portuguese for dummies, car maintenance for dummies, play the, learning the banjo for dummies. And the great thing about these books is that they try to explain things clearly in language you can understand. They really get to the heart of the subject while maintaining a clear focus on what it is all about. In Psalm 67, the author gets to the heart of mission while clearly explaining what it is all about. And he does this by highlighting several truths about mission, which we're going to look at soon. But first, I'm going to read the passage for us. Now, Psalm 67 I'll read the whole psalm. It's not so long. It only has seven verses. Psalm 67, starting at verse 1. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us, that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule peoples justly and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. The land will yield its harvest, and God, our God, will bless us. God will bless us, and all the ends of the earth will fear him. So as I said, in this psalm, the psalmist is talking about mission. He's explaining mission. What's at the, the heart of mission? Before he gets to this, however... He starts with a request. Have a look at verse 1 with me. The psalmist asks God for God's blessing. He says, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us. That seems like a strange thing to ask, doesn't it, in the context of a missional psalm. A mission's about other people, isn't it? Yet the psalmist is asking God to bless him and his people. He's asking them to show grace and favour. And why is this? What's going on here? Well, the psalmist reveals his reason in the very next verse, verse 2. He asks God to be gracious to his people and to bless them so that, as he says in verse 2, so that your may, ways may be known on earth, your, saving, your salvation among all nations. If the psalmist asks God to bless him and his people, to bless Israel, so that God might be known 
among the nations. God might be known among people who do not yet know him. Because he knows that when Israel is blessed by God, when God shines his face on Israel, the nations will notice and be attracted to Israel and to their God. And that way of thinking was common in the world of the psalmist. For him and the peoples that lived around him, the thinking was that the most powerful nation, the most prosperous nation, was that way because they had the most powerful God. So their thinking was powerful, prosperous nation equals powerful and mighty God. And so it was God's blessing on the nation that attracted other nations to them and to their God. And we see this very clearly, for example, in 1 Kings chapter 10, when the Queen of Sheba comes to visit Solomon. So I'm going to read a little bit of that now. So 1 Kings chapter 10, I'm going to read verse 1, and then we'll skip down to verse 4, and I'll read some more verses. But this is what we read there. We read that when the Queen of Sheba heard about the fame of Solomon and his relation to the name of the Lord, she came to test him with hard questions. And down to verse 4. When the Queen of Sheba saw all the wisdom of Solomon and the palace he had built, the food on his table, the seating of the officials, the attending servants in their robe, his cupbearers and the burnt offerings he made at the temple of the Lord, she, she was overwhelmed. She said to the king, The report I have heard in my own country about your achievements and your wisdom is true. But I did not believe these things until I came and saw them with my own eyes. Indeed, not even half was told me. In wisdom and wealth you have exceeded the reports I've heard. How happy your men must be. How happy your officials who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. Praise be to the Lord your God. The Queen of Sheba has heard about Solomon and his relationship to the Lord, we're told in verse 1. Sheba was probably in modern day Yemen or maybe even Ethiopia. Either way, it was hundreds of kilometres away from Israel. It was days and days, if not weeks of travel. And so this queen from this distant land had heard about Solomon and his God, prompting her to go and check things out for herself, to take this long journey, this journey of weeks, to check out Israel's God and the blessing that he, has, that he had on his people. And it's this sort of scenario that the psalmist of Psalm 67 has in view here. God has been gracious to Solomon and Israel. He has shone his face upon them. And his name is becoming known as people are coming to Israel to see what is happening and to hear about this God. And this was God's plan. God's plan for mission. God's plan for the people of Israel and for the world. And we see this all the way back in Genesis chapter 12, don't we, with God's promises to Abraham. If you remember God's promises to Abraham in Genesis 12, 2 and 3, he says to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I'll make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. God's plan was that blessing would come to the nations through God's people Israel, through Abraham's offspring. And God would bless Abraham and Abraham in turn would be a blessing to others. God would bless Israel and Israel in turn would be a blessing to others. And the blessing that those outside Israel would receive when they come, they would receive a knowledge of God. They would come to know the God of Israel, the one true God, the only God. And this is just what the psalmist requests in Psalm 67, isn't it? God bless us, he asks, bless your people so that the nations might come to know you and be saved. Or as he says in verse 7, so that all the ends of the earth will fear God. And in many ways, mission is still the same today, isn't it? The essence of it is the same as what we read about here in Psalm 67. 
Often we can envisage, envisage mission as something that we do. You know, evangelizing, speaking the gospel to someone. Or maybe it's events or a series of events that we do on certain occasions. You know, a mission week at church. Or, or maybe it's even having a special, going on a special trip. You know, we go on our mission trip. And while these things can make up mission, at the heart of mission still lies a people blessed by God, attracting or drawing others to this God. In 2017, an extensive survey on faith and belief was conducted in Australia. And one of the questions asked in the survey was around the idea of what it was that led people to investigate religion or spirituality, the one thing that attracted them to it? What is it that, that attracted you to religion? And the most common answer given was this, seeing people who live out a genuine faith. Nearly two-thirds of the non-Christian surveyed gave that answer. Genuine faith attracts other people. Genuine faith is attractive and it attracts others. And maybe this has been your experience. Maybe you were attracted to Jesus by someone with a really deep and genuine faith, with a joy, someone who lived out their faith. It made him attractive to you. It made you want to know him and live for him as well. And this is not by accident. No, this is the way that God has designed it to be. God's people who are blessed by him, attract and draw others to God. Now today this takes on a different form to what it did for the psalmist who wrote Psalm 67. God's people are no longer predominantly found in, all, in one location as they were in his day. God's people are scattered throughout the world, so there's no more coming to a central location like Israel to hear about God. And God's blessing is not primarily seen in the provision of harvests or protection from sickness or attack or any such thing like that. Now, God's blessing on people now, as Paul points out in Ephesians chapter 1, for example, are seen in things like being adopted into God's family, or redemption by the blood of Jesus, being sealed by the Holy Spirit. Now, they are an intimate knowledge of God, an intimate relationship with him. And this is the mechanism that God uses to reach those who do not know him. It's what mission is and how it works. And having defined this, the psalmist goes on in the rest of the psalm to look at some more aspects about mission. See, because for him, mission is more than merely making God known to those who don't know him. Now, this is important. This is, in fact, central. In fact, this is a very process and aim of mission, to make God known to those who do not know him. But the psalmist wants to focus on more than just the process of mission. He wants to focus on more than what mission is and how it works. He also wants to focus on two other things. He wants to focus as well on the, the purpose or goal of mission, and secondly, the heart of mission and he starts by looking at the purpose and the goal of mission in verse 3 and just as he did in verse 1 he expresses this in the form of a desire or a request have a look at verse 3 he says may the people praise you God may all the peoples praise you the desire of the psalmist and indeed God himself is that he will be praised not that simply people come to know him, but they will praise him and adore him as well. Now, one of the main reasons for this, apart from the fact that God is worthy of all praise, is that praising God is a natural result or outcome of knowing God. If you know God, you will praise him. It's inevitable. And we saw this with the Queen of Sheba, didn't we, in 1 Kings chapter 10. 
I had the pleasure of growing up in the 1980s. There were many great things about the 1980s. One of the most memorable things is perhaps fashion. It was pretty out there. And and one of the fashion high points or low points, depending on your point of view, was the nylon pants. Now, nylon pants have many wonderful properties. One of the negative things about them is that they're flammable. Nylon is a flammable material. And I remember one year a cousin of mine was given these red nylon shorts. He loved them. He wore them all the time, even in winter. Now, when you're wearing shorts in winter, you're bound to get cold. And so my cousin would often go and warm himself in front of the fireplace that he had at his house. Now, his parents explained to him how flammable nylon was, and he was warned time and time again that you need to be careful around fire when you're wearing, wearing nylon, especially an open fire. An ember could, could come up and, and burn the pants, or if you get too close, the heat could melt them. And one day, this is what happened to my cousin. He was standing there, and an, an ember flew up as the wood cracked and landed on his shorts. Now, fortunately, before too long, people could smell the burning nylon and the disaster was avoided. He got away mostly unscathed. And he learned his lesson the hard way, hadn't he? That nylon shorts and getting too fl- close to fire don't work out well. The inevitable outcome of nylon coming in contact with fire is that they melt. That's just the way it works. An inevitable outcome of knowing God is praising him. That's just the way it works. And in the end, that is what the goal of mission is. Praise and honour to God. And in the verse that follows, in verse 4, the psalmist explains at least in part why it is that knowing God will inevitably lead to his praise. Have a look at verse 4. He says there, May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples with equity and you guide the nations of the earth. The reason that those that come to know God will praise him, or as he says in verse 4, as the psalmist says, that will be glad and sing for joy, is because of who God is, because of his character and nature, because of who God is and how he expresses that, people will praise him. He rules the peoples with equity. He guides the nations of the earth. God is just. He is sovereign. He is trustworthy. And if we're in any doubt, the psalmist repeats this in verse 5. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. Now, the fact that the psalmist repeats this verse should get our attention. And it should get us asking why he's doing that. Why would he repeat a verse word for word? Repetition was often used in Hebrew to emphasise certain things. And this was done in a number of ways, but there were two ways in particular. The first and most obvious way is the thing that was repeated is the thing that was being emphasised. And we notice a lot of repetition in the Psalms, and this Psalm is no exception. In fact, there's repetition in nearly every verse. Have a look. Verse 1, the psalmist talks about God's blessing and making his face shine upon people. They're two ways of saying the same thing. Verse 2, he talks about God's ways and salvation, which in the context could be considered synonymous. Verses 3 and 5, as we've already seen, are exact repetitions of each other, word for word. Verse 6, the land yielding its harvest and God's blessing are also synonymous in this context. The author is clearly emphasising these things by repeating them. But there's also something else that he's emphasising in this psalm. Another way repetition can work is that it points the reader to a central idea that is being emphasised. And it does this by repeating ideas or truths around that central idea and bringing the reader's focus and attention into that central idea. And it appears that's what's happening here in verses 3 to 5. We have the repetition of verse 3 and 5 and it brings the focus in on verse 4. And what emphasises this even more is that the ideas of verse 1 and 2 are repeated in verse 
6 and 7 as well. And so it seems that the psalmist is deliberately drawing the reader's attention to verse 4. A verse that focuses on the character and nature of God, or at least two elements of the character and nature of God, his justice and his sovereignty. And in doing this, the author is signalling, among other things, that this is what is at the heart of mission. This is what mission is all about. God, his character and nature, that is what is at the heart of mission. Knowing God, a just God, a sovereign God, a loving God, a faithful God, a holy God, Knowing this God and finding joy in him and who he is, is what mission is all about. Because it's not only the message of mission, but it's also the method of mission. Those who don't know God will come to know him as God's people who praise him and take joy in him, attract him to others, make him attractive to others. As God's people praise him and display the joy of knowing him and living for him, other people will want what they have. Others will be opening to listen about God, to hear what people have to say about him and to listen to his gospel. And it will lead them to know him and praise him. It happened with the Queen of Sheba, didn't it? When she visited Solomon Those hundreds of thousands of years ago, really. And it's also happened many, many other times throughout history. Including to Hollywood actor Stephen Baldwin and his wife. See, Stephen Baldwin and his wife became Christians through their Brazilian housemaid who joyfully went around singing songs about Jesus as she cleaned the house. And Stephen Baldwin's wife was, was drawn by this lady and the joy that, she was, that, was, that was evident in her life. And she asked her about the songs that she was sharing, which gave this lady a golden opportunity to share the gospel. And over time, both Stephen Baldwin and his wife became Christians through this. He's seeing this lady have joy in God and express it, brought about a missional opportunity, brought about a gospel opportunity. Joy in God, praising God, faith in God leads to opportunities to share the gospel. Because genuine faith, genuine joy in God attracts people. And what's more, genuine faith and genuine joy in God cannot help but be shared. As Tim Keller puts it, if you truly enjoy something, you instinctively want other people to praise it too. Because praising it to others completes your enjoyment of that thing. I know this is true in my life. The things that I am passionate about, the things that I love, these are the things that I want to share with people. These are the things that bubble to the surface when I converse with people and spend time with them. And to be honest, this can vary for me as to what it is sometimes. There are phases in my life when I share more about God, about what I'm learning about him, what he's doing in my life, the joy and the pleasure that he's bringing. There are other phases in my life, though, where I would share more about things that aren't quite as significant, sport or another interest or a hobby of mine. The times when other things predominate in my life, in my thoughts and in my sharing, is when my joy in God is not where it should be. In fact, this is an indication that my joy in God is not where it should be. Because if my joy in God was fuller, where it needed to be, be, where it needed to be I would not be able to do anything but show it and share it. And how about you? What do you share about when you spend time with people? What bubbles to the surface in your interactions and conversations with others? 
Is your faith in God and the joy that comes from knowing him visible to those around you, especially those that you spend a lot of time with? If not, let me encourage you, as I encourage myself, to be praying about these things and working on these things. Come to God and ask him to give you a deep faith, to bring you to that sweet, sweet place of deep faith and dependence on him so that others might join you there. In the words of the man in Mark chapter 9, say to God, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. I do have faith, help me deepen my faith. Ask God to open your eyes even more fully to his awesome splendour and majesty, to his stunning grace and mercy, to his incomprehensible sovereignty and love and to his awe-inspiring glory and holiness. So that you become so completely gripped and amazed by these things, by this great God that you cannot help but share him with others in both the way you live and in what you say. And if if by God's grace you are already there, and I pray that many of you already are, ask God to keep you there in that sweet, place of deep fellowship with him because at times it can be easy to drift away can't it even having tasted the sweetness of God and often only often happen it often happens little by little just one degree at a time but as you keep moving the distance becomes greater and greater keep coming to God and asking him to keep you on course. Make that a regular prayer point. Pray that every morning. God, keep me focused on you. Help me learn more about you. Know you better. Love you more. Keep reminding yourself of the importance of keeping on course. Staying focused on God and who he is. His stunning grace and mercy. His incomprehensible sovereignty and love. His awe-inspiring glory and holiness. And meet with people who will encourage you to do these things, who will spur you on to focus on these things. Because our world needs people who love God, who have a deep and abiding joy in him that bubbles to the surface, that affects what we see as important, that impacts the way we use our time, that determines how we treat people. May God bring all his people to that point and many others as well who aren't yet his people because there is nothing more that a lost world needs than people who know God and live in joyful praise of him let's pray father in heaven we thank you that you are a God who has made yourself known and that knowing you is the most wonderful experience that anyone can ever have. Lord, we pray that those of us that don't know you yet would come to that point and experience that. We pray that those of us who do already know you would come to know that even more deeply and more fully and that our joy in you and love of you would overflow in the way we live and what we say so that others might be attracted to you and come to know you. Father God, I thank you for your grace in our life, for your desire to work in us in this way, and we pray that you would open each of us up to your work in this way in our lives. And we pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.